The penis itself, what is its function? It's the male organ of copulation. Um, this is how we transfer sperm from the male to the female. This is the organ that we use to do that. Um, the erectile tissue, thank you very much, um, is what actually becomes engorged and it causes the penis not only to enlarge, but to become firm. Both of these are really, really important in a process called the erection. You have actually two different columns of erectile tissue, or I should say two kinds of columns. You have two corpora cavernosa, one here and one here. And from the front, again, if you cut it like a lifesaver, one there and one here. Then you have the corpus spongiosum, which is this kind of darker, more salmon pink here that you can see down here. These are the erectile tissues that engorge with um, blood to help to achieve your erection. The skin of the penis is loosely attached to connective tissue that surrounds the erectile columns, which makes sense because if you're going from something that's relatively small to something that's erect, you need it to slide. You need it to have kind of the ability to do that. Um, thinner skin actually covers the glands penis here at the tip. And while the entire penis is very well supplied with sensory receptors, the glands penis actually has the most, making it the most sensitive portion of the penis. Now, the foreskin, or the prepus, um, covers the glands penis. Um, push comes to shove nowadays, well, I guess I shouldn't say nowadays. Back in the past, when um, boys were circumcised, mostly it was about religious practices. Nowadays, it's more about cleanliness Having a foreskin can be very challenging because it can, well, you have to clean it. And for a little boy, it's not always that easy. Um, so <clears throat> nowadays, it's kind of more commonplace to see um, circumcisions just as a medical practice, not necessarily a religious practice anymore. Um, the primary nerves, arteries, and veins actually pass along the dorsal surface of the penis there's kind of this midline vein that you can see right there. And then it's surrounded by an artery and on the outside is a nerve. You also have some other veins up here, the superficial veins, um, the superficial fascia veins. Um, there are some additional deep arteries in the corpora cavernosa as well. Um, to kind of help to uh, fill the uh, erectile tissue. Now let's talk accessory glands. So remember when I said that semen is not just sperm, we've got other things mixed in. Well, those come from our seminal vesicle, who's this guy here, our prostate gland, which is kind of this apple shaped gland here, and our bulbal urethral glands, which are these little teeny tiny guys here. The seminal vesicles are sac-shaped glands located near the ampulla of the ductus deferens. The prostate is glandular and muscul muscular tissue. It's surrounding the prosthetic urethra and it actually has two ejaculatory ducts that are entering. Remember that the ejaculatory duct is that combo of these two things here. And then those bulbal urethral glands, these little dudes down here, they are um, a pair of small glands right near the membranous urethra. Remember, that's the smallest part of our urethra. In males, in young males, they're about the size of a pea, but as males get older, they actually get smaller. It's a compound mucus gland um, at the base of the penis, and it has a single duct that enters that spongy urethra. And we'll talk about function in just a minute. So, semen itself, okay, gosh, that's a terrible color. There are some days when I wish these slides were just white. <laughs> it would make my life easier. So, semen itself, it's a composite of your sperm cells that make up about 5%. So, the little swimmers only make up about 5%. The secretions from the seminal vesicles make up about 60%. The prostate make another 30 
and then the bobal urethral glands actually make five. Um, so your semen is not primarily the swimmers. It's actually all of the other things, and you'll see why in just a bit. Two terms you need to understand. Emission, which is the discharge of all of the secretions from your um, testes, your seminal vesicles, your prostate, and your bobal urethral gland into your urethra. Notice it's not going anywhere yet. It's kind of getting ready, but it's not, it isn't ready to be transferred yet. When it is going to be transferred, we call that ejaculation. Ejaculation is the forceful expulsion of semen from the urethra, and it's caused by the contraction of basically three things. The urethra itself, skeletal muscles at the floor of the pelvis, and the muscles that are at the base of the penis. All three of these things actually get that semen out and across to the female. So before ejaculation, that ductus deferens starts peristaltic contractions, basically to propel its secretions toward the ampulla, that ever little teeny tiny widening at the end of the ductus deferens that I pointed out. The contractions of the ampulla, the seminal vesicle, the ejaculatory duct will cause the sperm cells and all of the secretions to move into the prosthetic urethra along with the secretions from the prostate. Where that little apple is, that's where it's kind of getting to the point of loading. Now, pre-ejaculate. I'm sure you've heard of pre-ejaculate. This comes from two places. One, the bulbal urethral gland, and two, you've got mucus glands in the urethra. So why? Why do we make pre-ejaculate? Well, one thing, it lubricates the urethra. If I'm talking about moving something in one shot from male to female, having that tube lubricated will actually help with that. The second thing, it's a small amount of lubrication for intercourse. It's not a lot, but it still exists. And I'm sure if anybody's sexually active, you know lubrication is important. Now, this is the big thing, the third thing. Neutraliz bleh, neutralization of both the male urethra and the female vagina. Just like sperm are temperature sensitive, they're also pH sensitive. And urine, as we discussed last chapter, is very acidic. If it comes into contact with urine, it'll basically destroy the sperm. It will become non-modal, it won't work anymore. Having kind of this clearing fluid go through basically makes sure that there is no extra urine sitting in there that can damage the sperm. As well, the female vaginal canal is also acidic. It's supposed to be acidic, but it's also acidic. And what that means is by having just a little bit of pre-ejaculate that is um, neutralizing to that acid, it helps to kind of prep the vaginal canal a little bit so that when my sperm gets there, it's still okay. Now, um, the testicles or testicular secretions, I should say, includes the sperm cells, a small amount of fluid, and metabolic byproducts. Those sperm are living cells, so they're going to need to, to metabolize. So that means they're creating waste. Anything that's alive is going to create waste, even if it's just um, plants. Plants create waste. Their waste product is oxygen, which we can utilize, but we create waste. How many times do you put stuff in a trash can, right? Now the seminal vesicles, they actually create a thick mucus-like secretion with fructose, citric acid, and nutrients to nourish the sperm. Remember what I said about the sperm. It's a nucleus with a motor and a propeller. That means I don't have any extra cell parts to make myself glucose or to do any of that. I've got mitochondria to run the, the propeller, but that's it. So if I'm not in an environment where I just readily have access to fuel, I'm not going to be able to go anywhere. That's one of the things a seminal vesicle is doing. It's pro providing me with that with the fructose, the citric acid, and the nutrients that basically keep the sperm going. Something else that's part of that is fibrinogen. Fibrinogen, if you think back, fibrinogen turned into fibrin, which was a coagulant. It actually helps stuff stick together. This is actually for weak coagulation of the semen 
immediately after it's ejaculated. Um, so the more of the product that I can get transferred in one shot, the more likely I am to have a successful pregnancy. If I can get my entire, lack of a better way to put it, load to stick together for transfer, then I'm actually increasing my chances. Adding fibrinogen as one of the factors to kind of hold everything together helps to make a better, I guess, opportunity for fertilizing an egg. The last thing that's in this um, seminal vesicle fluid is going to be prostaglandins. Now, if you think back to chapter 22, we said that prostaglandins caused smooth muscle contraction. In this case, this smooth muscle contraction can actually cause the um, uterus itself to contract, helping to kind of um, dip the cervix of the uterus into the pool of semen causing hopefully pregnancy again this is us as animals not as people who don't want to get pregnant but hopefully it increases the likelihood of pregnancy for the species now that was the seminal vesicle this guy up here okay now we're going to talk about the prostate this guy right here okay so it produces a thin milky secretion with a high pH to neutralize both the urethra and the vagina. So remember the bulbal urethral glands did this too, but now we've got 30% of that fluid actually being basically a neutralizing solution, which is good. Clotting factors basically are also in the prostate secretions that convert that fibrinogen into fibrin to make everything stick together. Now, something else that's there is fibrinolysin. It basically helps to dissolve the coagulation and releases the sperm once it's in the female reproductive tract to go and fertilize the egg. I don't want that um, clot to stay that way. I want it to kind of fall apart really quick so that my sperm can get to work on trying to fertilize that egg. So having fibrinolysin as kind of part of the original package actually works in my favor. Now looking at sperm. So this is the nucleus. Here is my engine, the mitochondria. And this tail is my propeller. The acrosome is up here. This acrosome is that enzyme cap that I was talking about. So let's talk numbers. Normal sperm count is about 75 to 400 million sperm per milliliter. And in a normal ejaculation, you can have between two and five milliliters. Now, let's go low end of the spectrum here. Let's say it's 75 million per mil, and let's say that I only have two mils of sperm. Well, that's still 150 million sperm. That's a lot, okay? When you talk about chances of getting pregnant, that, that's a pretty good number. Now, let's go high end of the spectrum. Let's say it's 400 million per mil and it's five mils. That's two billion sperm that are getting released in one ejaculation. So push comes to shove, unless you're using a condom or you are like religiously taking birth control, there's a real good chance that something can fertilize, okay? Once the sperm has been ejaculated and is in the female's reproductive system and thus in the correct environment, it becomes more modal. It actually starts to move a heck of a lot more, swim a lot more. Now, this is the interesting part. Most of them actually die on the trip to the oocyte. So going toward the uterus or going, going, okay, rewind. Entering the vagina, the sperm actually has to go through the cervix into the uterus and up the fallopian tube to fertilize the secondary oocyte. It doesn't fertilize that in the actual uterus itself. When it does that, it actually has to basically burrow a trail through the vaginal mucus to do that. And then once it actually reaches the oocyte, it actually has to penetrate the shell on the outside of that oocyte. Is it an act? excuse me, actual shell? No, not really, but just go with me on it. Now, this is the interesting part. This acrosome up here only lasts for so long. So 
imagine I have a pencil with an eraser and I start rubbing that eraser on my paper and I keep rubbing and keep rubbing and keep rubbing and keep rubbing. Eventually the eraser would wear down, right? That's exactly what happens with the acrosome. The first acrosome in line to start the tunnel starts tunneling and tunneling and tunneling and tunneling. And once its acrosome is empty, like that pencil eraser, it just drops and dies. Whoever's next in line then takes over and digs and digs and digs with its acrosome, wearing it down and wearing it down and wearing it down. Literally, you have sacrificial lambs all the way till you get to the surface of the egg, to the surface of the oocyte. And all they're doing is they're making a path, dying, and the next in line takes over, making that path, dies, the next in line takes over, making that path. So when I say most die on the trip to the oocyte, that's what I'm talking about. Literally, most of them are dying just trying to get there. And the few who haven't used their acrosomal cap yet will actually get an opportunity to penetrate the egg to fertilize the egg. So again, once that acrosome is depleted, once that eraser is gone, the sperm dies. So let's talk physiology of male reproduction. So it's dependent on two things, hormonal mechanisms and neuronal mechanisms. So endocrine system and nervous system. H hormonally, it's responsible for the development of the reproductive system. Literally, you get hormone surges in, um, in utero and you go basically off of the default setting of becoming a female and your sexual organs develop male. It's also responsible for their functional capa um, capacities. So literally, if you don't have enough testosterone, you won't be able to produce sperm to fertilize an egg. Development of secondary sex characteristics. So when we hit puberty, well, I say we, I'm not a guy, but just go with me on it. When we hit puberty, we start getting massive surges of testosterone. And those massive surges of testosterone are what are responsible for our voice deepening. We get terminal hair on our body. We get hair on our chest and our back and our arms and our legs that are thicker instead of looking like peach fuzz. Um, the barrel chest starts to form. If you think about guys, they don't have necessarily, you know, the hourglass angle, but their chest tends to be wider than women's. The ability to make sperm is controlled by hormones. If you don't have the right hormones, you can't, you can't. Um, we talked about gonadotropin releasing hormone, gonads being the testes. That's also another hormone that dictates that we make sperm. Influence over sexual behavior. Hormone levels actually do control your sex drive. And if you don't have high enough hormone levels, you tend to lack sex drive. That's one of the reasons why you now see um, quite a few commercials actually about um, testosterone supplement gels and things like that. Sorry, I've been talking for a while. I need to drink water. Um, but with that in mind, those hormones are kind of controlling your sex drive. The more hormones you have, the more sex drive you may have. As far as neuronal mechanisms, the nervous system, it's primarily involved in sexual behavior and the control of the sex act. The actual physical act itself is primarily neuronally controlled. Your nervous system has to do with getting all of the reflexes into the right places so that things happen the way they're supposed to. Brain-wise, psychologically, that is part of your sexual behavior as well. So this is testosterone right here. Um, the Leydig cells and the adrenal, um, the Leydig cells, the adrenal cortex and the Sertoli cells produce testosterone. It causes the development of the male sex organs in the embryo, like I said, even when you're in utero, when you're still in your mom's belly. Um, and the descent of the testes. Something that's interesting, the testes actually begin in the abdominal cavity. And once you start getting these surges of testosterone is when they go through this tube that actually leads them down so that they drop into the scrotum. 
that is required. That testosterone surge is required for that to happen. If it doesn't happen, they can actually end up stuck in the abdominal or pelvic cavity and surgery actually has to be performed to get them to go where they're supposed to. Um, it also causes enlargement of the genitals required for sperm cell formation. So the genitals themselves have to be a penis and they have to be able to get, well, it has to be able to get erect to transfer the sperm to be an effective organ for copulation. So that's another thing. So what are some of the other effects of testosterone? Well, we kind of talked about some of them. Hair growth, stimulation of leg, chest, pubic area, axillary region. Remember, axillary is just armpit, the face and the back. And inhibin can actually contribute to male pattern baldness. But we're talking about taking vellus hairs, our little baby peach fuzz hairs, and turning them into terminal hairs, hairs that more resemble what's on the top of our head. The skin texture also becomes rougher and coarser. Um, there is an increase in melanin. The, the testosterone actually does influence melanin production. If you have somebody who is Hispanic, who's a male next to somebody who's Hispanic that's a female, they can be brother and sister. Usually the male skin will end up darker um, and you get an increase in sebaceous gland secretion. Remember, sebaceous glands are the oil glands. This is one of the reasons why when we hit puberty, we tend to get acne. Um, there's hypertrophy of the larynx, which reduces tension on the vocal cords and the male voice goes deeper. So hypertrophy just means swelling. So if I've got two rubber bands stretched a certain length and then I bring the sides that they're stretched apart from together, it's going to loosen the rubber band. Think about a guitar string for a second. If I've got it really, really tight, it'll make a really high pitch, but as it goes looser, that sound gets deeper. That's how the male voice comes into play because when the larynx, your voice box hypertrophies, it actually loosens the, the stretch on those vocal cords. Um, stimulation of metabolism. Men have a higher metabolism than women because of their testosterone levels. Um, it's just a little higher. It's not like a huge difference, but it still exists. Um, it stimulates erythropoietin production. Thus, we end up with a higher red blood cell count in males. We mentioned that in chapter 19. I told you guys that it was due to testosterone. So here you go. Um, it does also have a minor mineral corticoid like effect. Remember, mineral corticoids had to do with sodium retention. So if I put salt in your mouth, what's the first thing you're going to ask for? Water. So by having sodium retained in the body, it also retains the fluid, which means that they tend to um, retain a little bit more fluid than women do. Um, it promotes protein synthesis in most tissues, basically meaning that they can increase in skeletal muscle mass. They can increase in skeletal muscle mass actually faster than we can, or well, I can, I guess, because I don't know if you're a guy or girl listening. So there you go. Um, rapid bone growth, but it also stimulates ossification of the epiphyseal plate. Remember that the epiphyseal plate is the growth plate. So <clears throat> during their growth spurts, that epiphyseal plate stays cartilage because they're still growing. Once testosterone reaches a certain level though, it basically indicates to the body, you're mature now, you're making sperm that can fertilize an egg, you don't need to grow anymore. So those plates actually completely solidify. And when they solidify, that's it, you're done growing, you're your final height. So sex, male sexual behavior and the male sex act. Testosterone is required to not only initiate, but to maintain sexual behavior. It enters the hypothalamus and the surrounding brain. It influences their function, basically resulting in sexual behavior. It may also be converted to other steroids to aid in sexual behavior. Now, the male sex act itself is a series of complex reflexes. It involves first the erection of the penis, then um, the secretion of the mucus into the urethra, the pre-ejaculate. Eventually, we get to the point of emission where we're kind of loading so that we can transfer, and then we transfer through the process of ejaculation. 
after ejaculation, they're, well, actually I shouldn't say after. Okay, so they're pleasurable sensations during sex. It results in a climactic sensation we call an orgasm, which in males we associate with the ejaculation. It's followed by a resolution phase in which the penis becomes flaccid. There's an overall feeling of satisfaction that exists, and the male can't achieve an erection or ejaculate for many minutes or sometimes even hours, maybe even longer. Once an ejaculation has happened, they're done. So looking at the path, the sensory neurons in the genitals send action potentials up through the pudendal nerve. Then that'll go to the sacral region of the spinal cord, which has the reflexes that basically control the erection and the ejaculation. That's all basically controlled by the spinal cord. But from the sacral region here, we can actually keep going up to the brain where we get that conscious sensation of um, sexual, or I should say sexual sensation. We get the conscious sexual sensation. Now, why do I mention this? If a man has damage to his spinal cord and he's paralyzed, but this part of his spinal cord is still intact, he may still be able to father children since it's a reflex coming down that causes the emission and the ejaculation as well as the erection. It's reflexive. They don't necessarily need the brain's involvement. Now, will he feel the sexual sensations? No, but if he really wants to have kids with that part of the spinal cord intact, it's still a possibility. So we've got physical stimuli and we've got psychic stimuli. In other words, psychological. So physical stimuli, rhythmic massage of the penis, especially the glands penis, remember that's the one that has the most um, sensory receptors, is an essential source of sensory action potentials to initiate the erection and the ejaculation. Additional sensory input um, to reinforce those sexual sensations can be from the surrounding tissue, like the scrotum, the anal region, the perineum, the pubic region, Touching in other places may enhance that sexual sensation. Engorgement of the prostate and the seminal vesicles with their um, secretions may also reinforce the sexual sensations. Now, something that's kind of interesting, irritation of the urethra can actually cause an erection. Now, um, little boys that get UTIs sometimes will experience erections and it isn't because oh they're thinking of sex it's literally just the irritation of the urethra which I thought was kind of interesting now psychic stimuli again psychology there are additional inputs that can reinforce reinforce sexual sensations sight sound odor and thoughts may have major effects on sexual reflexes. So if you've set up, you know, a romantic dinner and you've got candlelight and roses and, you know, romantic music playing and the lights are dimmed, that may basically reinforce that idea of having sex. But bad thoughts can do the exact opposite. If you're standing next to a dumpster that has dirty baby diapers in it, I'm pretty sure you're not going to go, yeah, I'm totally in the mood. It, it just doesn't work that way. So it can be either positive reinforcement or negative reinforcement. Adolescent dreams are kind of an example of this. It's almost like the body's doing test runs to make sure that everything is in working order because again, evolutionarily, I am a mature male that can fertilize an egg. We need to make sure all of the parts and pieces work. Impotence and erectile dysfunction or erectile dysfunction. Um, it's an inability to achieve or maintain an erection and thus accomplish the male sex act. It may be mental or it may be physical. Now, if it's physical, it's actually pretty simple to take care of. You give them a Viagra, you give them a Cialis, and it works fine. But if it's mental, it's not. Mental roadblocks are not as simple as giving somebody medication. So, um, the first component of the male sex act is the erection. The penis becomes enlarged and, rivet, and rigid. Action potentials travel to the pudendal nerve, which travel to the arteries that supply the erectile tissue. Smooth muscle relaxation causes them to dilate as the others constrict, shunting the blood to the erectile tissue, filling the sinusoids and compressing the veins and it builds the blood pressure in the sinusoids, causing inflation and rigidity. Action potentials for an erection come from 
the sympathetic nervous system T1 to L1 and parasympathetic nervous system S2 to S4. It's important, but, um, okay, so PNS is important, but if damage to the SNS, if damage the SNS center at T1 and L2 can actually take over. The parasympathetic also causes the mucus secretions from the mucus glands and the bulbal urethral glands at the base of the penis. So if you look here, this is a flaccid penis, okay? You can see that I've got these sinusoids, these kind of chambers here, but they're pretty empty. There's not a lot in them right now. And to be honest, the way that this is working here, the blood is just kind of flowing down and then emptying through this vein and leaving. When you get an erection, this artery up here that was teeny tiny before actually gets a lot bigger. And what that does is it starts filling these chambers. And as it starts filling these chambers, it actually kinks the vein down here that was draining before. If you look here, there's plenty of room for that blood to get into that vein. Now it's like I'm, I'm kinking a hose in my yard, which means that these sinuses actually fill with blood, which gives you an erection that keeps your penis rigid. Now, if you've ever seen a Cialis commercial or a Viagra commercial or anything like that, they will say, if you have an erection lasting for more than four hours, seek medical attention immediately. What is not happening in this second picture? What have I effectively done? I've cut off the blood flow. The blood isn't flowing because I've kinked. Hang on. The blood isn't flowing here because pretty much what I've done is I've kinked the end here. What happens to any tissue when you cut off blood flow? It dies. So when they say if you have an erection lasting for more than, that's what they're saying. If you have not been able to get rid of this erection in four hours, you need to come in because we need to get the blood out of there and get blood flowing again. Because if we don't, we're gonna have an issue. Okay, does that make sense? Literally, you can damage the tissue in the penis. So yeah, something to think about. So the sympathetic nerve centers um, become stimulated as sexual tension builds, and this controls emission. Again, that's just the accumulation of everything in the urethra. Um, the um, sympathetic nerve center action potentials cause the peristaltic contractions of the reproductive ducts. Remember, ducts is just tubes, and it stimulates the seminal vesicles in the prostate to release their secretions. Semen accumulates in the prosthetic urethra, produces action potentials that travel to the pedendal nerve and then go to the spinal cord for integration. Sympathetic motor output, fight or flight, it causes constriction of the internal sphincter in the bladder. Why? Because I don't want urine mixing with my semen. If I let that happen, it's going to kill the sperm. The somatic motor, this is voluntary movement. Action potentials go to the skeletal muscle at the base of the penis, at the urogenital diaphragm. You get rhythmic contractions. The semen goes into the urethra. You get ejaculation. You get muscle tension throughout the body that increases, and then you get that relaxation and overall feeling of satisfaction that we talked about in the previous slide. 